coming up next on Arizona Horizon. It's our monthly look at issues in and around Tucson and Southern Arizona. Also tonight, we look at some of the winners at Arizona Forward's Environmental Excellence Awards. And we'll see how one man is making custom denim jeans using Arizona products. That's all next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. The Phoenix City Council votes today on a move to store the city's excess CAP water in Tucson. The idea is for Phoenix to be able to draw on its reserves in the event of a Colorado River shortage in the coming years. By storing the water in Tucson, Phoenix would take advantage of Tucson's more advanced water pumping and aquifer system with the resulting higher water levels helping Tucson control its water pumping costs. And speaking of water, cleanup efforts continue at Tempe Town Lake after record rainfall from recent storms made a mess of things near the lake's western dam. Work on the city's $41 million dam restoration project is still on hold, but is expected to resume by the end of the week. And the city says that mosquito traps in the sludge near the dam have thus far shown no signs of West Nile virus. Two lake swims have been canceled this month due to concerns over water quality. Time again for Southern Exposure, our monthly look at issues from south of the Gila. I'm here once again to talk about what's happening in the southern part of the state is Jim Ninsel. He's senior writer for the Tucson Weekly. Good to see you again. Thanks for having me up here. It's still a little warm in the studio after that debate you had last yeah, night. Ted. Yes, I, that was a little fiery. Yes, we had to kind of hose things down a little bit here, but we're glad you're here. Um, and speaking of politics, and obviously this is a big down in Tucson, the Barbara McSally race. There was an ad regarding stalking. What's going on? What's this all about? Well, there was an ad put out by Gabrielle Giffords and Mark Kelly. The, uh, they have a group called Americans for Responsible Solutions, which is attempting to address uh, gun violence legislation. Legislation. And uh, one of the, they've, they've been involved in uh, campaigns across the country, uh, and one of the uh, areas they're playing in is Congressional District 2. Uh, they're running ads going after Martha McSally, who is running against Ron Barber, who uh, took Gabrielle Gifford's seat after she uh, resigned, and he was uh, her former district director. There's a very close relationship between his campaign and, and Gabby Giffords. Uh, they ran an ad saying that uh, Martha McSally uh, didn't support background checks on uh, people who were convicted of misdemeanor stalking uh, around the country, and it was very very emotional ad. It featured a woman talking about how her uh, her husband and daughter were killed by a man who was stalking them, mm -hmm. and a uh, very tearful woman talking about her experience. And it went to Martha McSally saying that she did not uh, support this sort of legislation. Uh, went national. Uh, a lot of attention focused on it. The Arizona Republic was very critical of the ad, saying that it was uh, vile and disgusting. And then uh, eventually, uh, the ad actually came down a day early uh, after the McSally campaign came out and said that yes, she did support uh, changing federal law to allow background checks on uh, or re requiring people who had uh, uh, been convicted of misdemeanor stalking to be added to this background check list. So again, she, she clarified, I should say, her position on that. But at the same time, she said and revealed that she was once the target, the victim of stalking. She did, and, and we've asked her for details about this, and she has said uh, she would not reveal any of the uh, details, uh, has, has sidestepped all reporters who have asked him uh, what exactly this had to do with, was this person convicted or not. Uh, and I, I think this is almost like a political Rorschach test, uh, this ad, because people who uh, were sympathetic towards Martha McSally thought the ad went too far. People who were more sympathetic towards uh, Gabby Giffords say that it was a perfectly legitimate uh, effort to try to uh, talked to, about the uh, importance of these background checks and, and the holes in the background check system. And it's interesting that, that the McSally uh, campaign had previously said, you know, they did not want to change federal law at all. And then she came forward and said, okay, this is an area I wanted to change. And, and they're saying it's a victory because they forced her to take a position on background checks that they agreed with. And indeed, uh, the McSally basically said she was held in a hostage-like situation in a car. She wasn't, the threats were made against her. She wasn't safe at home. She wasn't safe anywhere. But really no more information other than that. Right. I've asked uh, the McSally campaign about it. Other reporters have asked her about it, and she has uh, so far refused to say anything more on that. Other than the Rorschach test, impact on the race overall? Is it just basically if you're for one side, you're for one side? 
I, I think so, although the McSally campaign has definitely capitalized off of the uh, Re Arizona Republic uh, interview. They put out an ad saying, uh, oh, these ads are vile and disgusting that are being run against her. So I think she's she's played that really well. How is that race shaping up? It's neck and neck from what I understand. Uh, both candidates are uh, running very hard down there. It's a district that's one third Republican, one third Democrat, one third independent. So it's one of the most competitive in the country. Uh, both sides are filling the airwaves with a lot of ads. As, uh, as you're probably yes. experiencing up here as yes. well. And uh, both sides are, are working very hard to uh, win that seat. I it'll, think it's still up in the air. It'll be very interesting. All right, um, flooding up here in the valley, huge. Major impact on a lot of areas, a lot of damage, this sort of thing. How did Tucson and Southern Arizona handle all these storms? You know, we had one storm that uh, brought a lot of flooding. A, a few people were killed in these storms, a lot of damage around the county, some bridges washed out in uh, the Tucson area. And then uh, Odile was supposed to bring a great deal of rain to us. We had people out filling up sandbags and trying to protect their homes. And then we only got a few drops because the storm got blown off course and uh, didn't even end up uh, really affecting Tucson. However, uh, other areas of Southern Arizona were hit hit pretty hard by that, uh, particularly down in the Cochise County area. So uh, there, there's been some pretty significant damage in some of the areas, but I don't think it's been uh, as severe as what you experienced up here. As usual, Phoenix gets uh, a lot more attention than we do. <laughs> yeah, well, I think justified this time. Um, as far as flood control in Tucson, as far as infrastructure in Tucson in particular, is. Uh, are those issues these days or are things relatively stable along those lines? Well, our roads need a lot of work in Tucson in general, but uh, in terms of our bridge infrastructure, it's it's in pretty good shape. There was a, a few bridges that they were concerned about and had to close uh, during the one storm that we did receive. Okay, a couple of uh, art festivals down there, the Tucson Meet Yourself Festival and the Loft Film Fest. Come, is, are these this weekend? When are these happening? Uh, Tucson Meet Yourself will be uh, next weekend. It's a big deal. It's a uh, culture that's been going on for decades. Uh, all the different cultural groups in Tucson, the ethnic groups come out. They set up food booths. If you can buy food on a stick, they're selling it. <laughs> and uh, we've got uh, a lot of uh, performances from musical groups and dancers and folks like that. Just an amazing opportunity for you to see the, the cultural breadth of Tucson uh, in one park in one weekend. And then uh, in mid-October, we're going to have the Loft Cinema. Cinema Film Fest, that's our independent art house down there, a nonprofit organization. They're going to bring dozens of films to Tucson over the course of one weekend, and it's going to be a spectacular event. Uh, they really just do amazing things with that movie house. And, and as far as both of these festivals are concerned, are these things that have been around for a while? Are they relatively new, gaining momentum in general? Arts festivals in Tucson. Wonderful uh, collection of arts festivals, and, and a lot, whole lot more going on there uh, in, the, in October and November, but these are the the big ones. Uh, Tucson Meet Yourself has been around for decades. The Loft Film Festival is in its fifth year. Uh, this year they're going to bring in Larry McMurtry and show the Last Picture Show. Oh my uh, we're going to have Stacy Keach and uh, Bruce Dern. There's going to be a showing of Nebraska. They're going to talk about their careers. So uh, they, they bring in some uh, big names and uh, really some, some terrific films you're certainly not going to see anywhere else that have been winning festivals around the country uh, as well as some bigger show movies you may have seen. All right, very impressive. Well, we'll keep an eye on that uh, Barbara McSally race and other issues south of the Gila River. Good to see you again. Thanks for joining Always us. Always a pleasure, Ted.
Arizona Forward's Environmental Excellence Awards were recently handed out. The awards are for projects, organizations, and buildings that set standards for achieving a balance between the built and natural environment with a focus on sustainability. Diane Brossard, President and CEO of Arizona Forward, joins us now to talk about some of the We can't talk about all of the winners. Well, come on, let's we would all. he be there all night. <laughs> like we were. Like we were. Yes, like we were. <laughs> um, again, what, what are, what is this? Awards, sir. What are these honors all about? This is the 34th year of recognizing contributions to the environment. This year, some of them throughout the state of Arizona, primarily in Maricopa County for uh, the majority this year. But next year, we're taking the whole thing statewide, which is really exciting. Big news. So Valley Forward started with the Valley. Now you're kind of going north, central, south, and then and then, now it's just going to be everywhere in Arizona. It's going to be everywhere. My goodness. This is the 13th year of presenting in partnership with SRP, and Lori Singleton was chair of the event for the last 13 years. And so we're all revved up and ready to go. So uh, what are the criteria and, and who judges? I mean, how does that work? We select a panel of jurists for their expertise in each of the award categories, which range from buildings and structures to site development and landscape, media, art, education, lots of different things. Uh, Don Henninger was our lead judge this year, sort of the generalist who sat through two days of judging. The other jurists were one day. See, Ted, you thought you had it bad. You really didn't. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and, and do people or groups, do they submit or do you guys just go out and find things and go, that looks cool. No, they submit. They In fact, submit. this was a very competitive year. We had over 100 entries, and I was pleased uh, that they were a full spectrum of projects. There were, were some overriding themes, lots of solar projects, mm -hmm. a few river restoration, a lot of uh, desert preservation types initiatives, and a, and a bunch of uh, projects that focused on education. Well, let's talk. So, let's good. talk about the winners here, and we'll start with the solar project, the Solana Generating Station. That was among the big winners. Uh, Tell us more. Well, this project won the best of show. So each project, each category has one Crescordia first place award. And from the Crescordias, we picked the best of. And Solana Generating Station was is the world's largest parabolic trough plant uh, and the first solar plant in the nation to produce electricity at night. A first for Arizona is really uh, located 70 miles west of Phoenix, just outside the town of Gila Bend, situated on uh, three square miles of agricultural land. It's incredible. It's unlike any traditional solar plant. It can, continues to produce at full capacity even when the sun goes down, then stores that and uh, supplies clean energy to APS for its customers as part of a 30-year uh, power plant agreement. And that baby was, a, that was the big winner, wasn't it? That was the big winner. Okay, uh, next uh, one we're going to look at is a Coconino Building Program. Now, what's this all about? Another first. It is the first in the country of its kind. It encourages sustainable building practices throughout Coconino County and provides free sustainable building consultations, site evaluations, and design services. It was adopted in 2003, and so far more than 4,000 members of the community have been able to use the program's resources. And, and is, this, is this a is a test project here we're looking at here? Is this the real deal? What what no, is? it's a real deal. Um, th th they have uh, resulted in real life projects, yeah. and working with consultants and teaching people about green design and energy conservation and all that good stuff. All right. Uh, Fresh Express was a winner. This is a Explain, really, yeah, please. this is a really cool project. It's a collaboration um, that provides fresh produce in a 25 square mile area between downtown Phoenix and downtown Tempe. That's part of the Discovery Triangle region. It's been deemed, uh, parts of it, a food desert. They can't get access to affordable fresh produce. And so the team launched Fresh Express um, in April as a not-for-profit mobile produce market operating out of a retired repurposed bus, a municipal bus. Bus. And so it sells affordable, high quality fresh fruits and vegetables at elementary schools, senior living facilities, low income housing projects, and community centers. You know, it was funny. I think that got the biggest response from the audience. Well, I mean, people just love that idea. They do. And Don Keith, who's the president of Phoenix Community Alliance and, and Discovery Triangle, came up to me afterwards and he goes, you guys should have a People's Choice Award. I go, why? Because you think you're going to win <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. People just love that idea. He made a wonderful speech, and it was it was very heartwarming and enlightening, which is kind of the idea behind this whole thing. It's what's good about Arizona and how we are moving forward. Absolutely. And I'm so excited to, you know, we, we've got a good smattering of projects from around the state. We had added a new statewide category this year, the Governor's Award for Technology, uh, Energy and Technology Innovation and received lots of entries um, in that category. And, uh, and the Stewardship Award also is statewide. Yeah. So all it's, right. it's good to see. Uh, Transit 2000 among the winners. What's this all about? Well, 
T2000 is what we like to call it, served as a blueprint for the Valley's transit investments, promoting multimodal transportation options, i.e. alternatives to the automobile. And for years, we've been a very auto-centric uh, society, and we've built on the fringes of the central city. So um, T2000 moved Phoenix from the 34th largest transit system in the country to 28th, so that's a big jump, and paved the way for an influx of sustainable public and private transit-oriented development. So good not only for moving people from point A to point B, but for the development that occurs around Indeed. that. Uh, and, and so it improved connectivity and livability and um, got more rapid bus service and all kinds of you know, all light right. rail, all good stuff. All right, our next, uh, we're gonna look at the, something called Complete Streets. Yeah, and it's interesting because two transportation oriented projects, um, winning Cres Gordias, uh, that was, we had two categories this year that had double crest Gordia, so the judges broke their own role of one for cat, and they were very <laughs> deserving. Yeah. Uh, this this uh, Complete Streets Ordinance is, is uh, highly innovative. Uh, it is the silver lining in the market crash in that we went from you know emphasizing sprawl at the far edges of the desert to walkable neighborhoods connected by multiple transportation choices in the urban core. And the Phoenix City Council just adopted this in July, two ordinances aimed at changing the way existing and future streets are planned, designed, and constructed. Um, so it's important yeah. to the health and well-being of residents and very, uh, on, on the cutting edge. Lots of cities across the nation are now adopting complete streets ordinance. So it was very progressive of, okay. of Phoenix to do so. Uh, back to solar here, Tucson Unified School District with a solar project? Yeah, there were a couple of um, solar projects related to schools. Tucson Unified won a Crescordia, so did the Washington uh, District uh, win, win one. This is the largest distributed school solar project in the nation without utility incentives. It encompasses 42 schools and produces 11 megawatts of power, so pretty comprehensive. And will supply, once it's fully uh, utilized, it'll be 80% of the electricity needs it'll meet at each site. Um, saving the district $170,000 in its first year and more than $11 million uh, in energy costs over the 20-year term of the project. All right. So very, very nice. Yeah, very nice. Yeah. Um, now, we talked about the expanded awards. Our next winner is the town of Clarkdale. Uh, this is a personal favorite, Ted, because I actually did that. I kayaked down that river. <laughs> did you? The, the mayor of Clarkdale, Doug Von Gossig, um, takes people down that river all the time. I'm, I'm sure he's gonna love that I'm telling everyone this, <laughs> but it is, it incorporates environmental conservation, education, economic development, and collaborative approaches to land management. The, the project really instills in people a sense of um, importance to the natural resource of, of the river. The Verde River is going to be the eighth river in Arizona that um, could be destroyed by excess groundwater depletion and surface water consumption. So we have to do something about it. And by taking these tours and, and doing education and outreach, people become more vested and watch how they are looking at their water use and, yeah. and how we get our water. All right, very encouraging there. Uh, another winner, an old familiar, and this this is a good thing for expanding this to southern Arizona and other parts yes. around, because the Desert Sonora Museum can once again be recognized, and boy, that, <laughs> place, that place is recognized a lot. It is amazing. I, I, I take it you've been there. Yes. Yeah, and if, if anybody out there hasn't been there, it's really a place to visit. It's an Arizona point of pride. It was ranked by TripAdvisor.com as the ninth top museum in the world for 2013. Tracks a half a million visitors annually and inspires conservation of the Sonoran Desert which is one of the most unique and, and special deserts on earth. It was founded in 1952 and is recognized internationally as a model institution. It's a 98 acre facility and it has a fusion experience. So they have a zoo, a botanical garden, an art gallery, natural history museum, yeah. and an aquarium. Yeah. I mean, and pretty it's, impressive. It's, yeah, it's a really all encompassing kind of situation it down is. there. It Our is. last photograph is a bunch of people smiling at me. What, what are they smiling <laughs> for? What's going well, on here? Well, those are the President Award recipients um, from Solana. So okay, these gentlemen so from APS and from Solana uh, Generator, Ab Ab Eben Goa. Yeah. And so they were very happy and excited about that. And well, and that's, you bring that up. This is one of the, you do, I do some of these things, you know, and, and, and a lot of these things are encouraging and some are not, maybe some much. This one, everyone is just so excited and happy to be celebrating things that are sustainable, that are forward-moving, that make Arizona look like uh, we got our act together. Well, 
so often we look at what's wrong with our state and you know focus on the negative and so you're right this is very positive and I know when people win the Chris Gordy Awards they proudly display it in their offices and you know That's I well love seeing that. Yeah it sets the bar for sustainability in a range of categories. And, and real quickly now, is the focus going to continue to expand or just the areas covered? We promise not to make the program any longer. <laughs> yeah, <that's a> good <laughs> idea. We're gonna, it, the, the categories are going to change. Some of them will, will change as we go statewide. Um, but we're going to streamline and we're looking for input on how to make it better. Uh, this is, we call it the Academy Awards of the Environmental Community, and I think the recipients feel like they're walking the green carpet. Well, congratulations <laughs> on another very successful program and uh, looking forward to seeing next year because that's going to be a hoot. Great, you're going to MC for us again. Uh, I, I think so. <laughs> you did a fabulous job. Thank we you very it. much, Thank and good you. to see you again. You as well. We want to hear from you. Submit your questions, comments, and concerns via email at ArizonaHorizon at ASU.edu. In 1872, Levi Strauss and Jacob Davis came up with an idea to use copper rivets to strengthen denim cloth. The idea was a hit, and jeans soon became a mainstay of American clothing. Producer Shauna Fisher introduces us to a Phoenix man who is taking jeans to a whole new level. To say Roman Acevedo loves denim is an understatement. For him, it's a way of life. You know, I remember having the big drawer full of 501s where I would pull the drawer open and I would look through them to find the ones with the least amount of holes so I could wear those to school. You know, so denim for me, you know, it just takes me back to, back to being a young kid running around the city and um, I think it kind of resonates with a lot of people that way. After 18 years in the restaurant business, Acevedo decided to open Lawless Denim, a custom denim and leather goods store. We do everything from denim jeans, jackets, shirts, uh, leather jackets. All our belts are made by us. All our women's totes, our denim and leather totes, and our oiled leather totes are done right here. Rows and rows of denim line the walls. And chances are when you create a custom pair of jeans at Lawless, they will also be one of a kind. We've selected some of the finest denims in the world, primarily cone mill and Japanese. It's all salvaged denim, and we work very hard to source very limited production, very limited runs, maybe dead stock. So we'll get 50, maybe 100 yards if we're lucky, and from there you get to select your denim. Uh, then you'll pick your buttons, your pocket liners, your thread colors, and then we take you in for a fitting. And we take about 10 different measurement points so we get the perfect fit for you. Johanna Root is coming in to get fitted for her second pair of jeans. She says being able to be a part of the designing process is what caught her eye. And then from then just picking out which one looked coolest to me and it was, it was really awesome. And then picking out um, buttons and rivets and stitching. Um, you can have three different kinds of stitches and different colors and so it's, you can really get creative um, designing them. I went for the gun metal. <laughs> exciting. It takes roughly two to three weeks for Acevedo's seamstresses to sew the jeans. It's exacting work. Since they're working with a limited supply of denim, they have to be sure each cut and each stitch is perfect. It's that dedication that has driven Acevedo to pursue his second passion, putting people to work. I started Lawless um, for two things. One, I, I love denim and I love leather. It's, it's those materials that only get better with age. And secondly, I wanted to find a way to put people back to work on a consistent basis. And what I think I've identified is a real need, you know, and that need is the skill set to make our own goods. So that's what we're all about. How many people I can put to work and give them a good job with, with a good career. His goal is to put 200 people in Phoenix to work. Part of that work involves creating their own denim using 14 vintage looms from the 1920s that Acevedo has housed in a nearby warehouse. These were the kind of looms that Levi Strauss used to use. And uh, what we're going to be doing with these is setting them up to produce denim and chambray. To my knowledge, it hasn't been done west of the Mississippi in a salvage format. So it's something that we're very excited about. We'll be using Arizona Pima cotton to do that. So we decided, let's take this a step further. Let's not only make our own jeans and use our own Arizona copper for our buttons, but let's make our own denim and chambray. In the end, for Acevedo, this is much more than just a business. 
It's a chance to weave together his dreams and his community. You know, uh, when I close up the store at the end of the day and I walk out of here, I'm always fixated on my next move and what's going to happen the next day and what do I got to do to continue to grow this and take it to the next level and how can we perfect the product even more and, and being proud of, of, of having something that really you know, makes a difference here in Arizona. Lawless Denim is located in Cityscape in downtown Phoenix. Thursday on Arizona Horizon, hear about a conference being held to discuss indigenous sustainability and environmental issues and we'll learn about a citizen project to thoroughly examine a ballot measure. That's Thursday evening at 5.30 and 10 after the Roosevelt's on Arizona Horizon. Is, that, is the Roosevelt's going to be on again? I'm not sure about that. We'll check on that. That's it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thanks for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.